My name is Jeffrey Skolnick, and I'm the Vice President of Clinical Development for Novia's DNA Immunotherapies for Oncology. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome Dr. David Reardon, the Clinical Director for the Center of Neuro-Oncology, Professor of Medicine at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Professor at Harbor Medical School, Boston, Massachusetts, in a conversation in which we'll talk about DNA immunotherapy and glioblastoma. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Jeff. Dr. Reardon, we've just learned a bit about glioblastoma as a disease. Can you share with us a bit about the history of the treatment of GBM and why it's such a difficult disease to treat? Sure. Uh, so glioblastoma, the number one or most frequent uh, malignant cancer arising in the brain in adult patients, um, has historically always been one of the most difficult of cancers to treat. Um, historically, we have relied on surgery, which, as you can imagine, is challenging and difficult in the brain uh, for tumors that are intrinsic uh, arising in the brain. But nonetheless, uh, significant technological advances have occurred over the last uh, decades, and in particular in the last few years, to allow our neurosurgical colleagues to effectively debulk the main mass, macroscopic mass of the tumor in a significant percentage of patients. A glioblastoma, however, is a disease that um, is remarkably infiltrative uh, and invasive. Although it does not metastasize, and that's a mystery why this tumor rarely uh, metastasizes, but it makes up for that capability by being incredibly invasive and infiltrative into the adjacent uh, brain and, and uh, uh, cerebral cortex. Um, so surgery is very helpful at, at decompressing the macroscopic mass, which can often improve symptoms for patients, uh, but unfortunately it's not curative. The tumor will uh, come back and oftentimes um, come back in a fairly short order, even with an aggressive resection. So we have traditionally relied on additional cytotoxic therapy uh, for patients after surgery, maximal safe surgical resection is performed. Uh, and that uh, for many years was radiation therapy alone. Back in 2005, after many attempts to demonstrate that chemotherapy could have an impact on the outcome of this disease, Roger Stoop and colleagues from the ERTC and the NCIC north of the border in Canada uh, demonstrated that a chemotherapy drug, temozolomide, when added to radiation therapy, could improve survival uh, for patients. And at that time, that became our standard of care for newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients. Maximum safe resection, radiation therapy, which is typically given Monday through Friday over six weeks, that is the historical dogma along with uh, the chemotherapy drug temozolomide. And temozolomide is given during radiation therapy and then uh, for monthly cycles for approximately six months after uh, radiation therapy is completed. That has been our historical standard of care. There have been a number of clinical trials, including randomized phase three studies, trying to improve on that standard of care and so far uh, those efforts have not been successful. So today uh, in my clinic, um, uh, 14 to 15 years after that standard of care was established, we are still offering that to our patients as their best established uh, treatment um, uh, intervention. The reasons we haven't been able to improve outcome for patients uh, with this challenging tumor, there are several. Um, we have learned tremendously about the biology of glioblastoma over the last uh, decade and, and few years in particular, but it's been very challenging to translate those advances from the laboratory and from the basic science research done on these tumors into effective and improved treatments for patients. Uh, first of all, uh, we're dealing with a tumor that's arising in the brain, and by definition, we have to overcome the blood-brain barrier that Mother Nature designed uh, our central nervous system with to protect it from any potential uh, toxic or noxious exposures. Unfortunately, that level of protection also excludes most of the uh, chemotherapies and many of the biologically based uh, therapies uh, for, uh, for cancer. Fortunately, 
our immune system very readily passes through the blood-brain barrier and goes back and forth between the systemic and, and central nervous system compartments quite readily. So immunotherapy, unlike cytotoxic therapies and many of the biologic targeted therapies, we do have an advantage where um, uh, mobilized immune effector cells can, can move into the tumor uh, in, the, in the brain very readily. Another um, significant challenge with glioblastoma, which is not unique to glioblastoma, but I think um, uh, probably uh, optimized to a degree more so than in most challenging cancers, is the ability of this tumor to adapt and become resistant. Um, we have, what I tell my patients is that we have treatments that can help the majority of patients. The problem is the durability of those treatments uh, how long they can last, and ultimately the tumor's ability to adapt and become resistant. The other um, factor I think that contributes to significant challenge in developing therapies for these tumors is that we've learned they're remarkably heterogeneous, not only from patient to patient, but even within the same patient. Uh, areas and regions of the tumor may be markedly different in terms of the um, uh, dysregulated cell signaling pathways that are giving the tumor cells a growth advantage, uh, the blood flow patterns within the tumor, um, um, hypoxia, other uh, physical features within the tumor, all of those things can vary markedly uh, within the tumor, uh, within an individual given patient's tumor. Uh, I think underscoring the fact that this is not likely to be a, a tumor where a one-size-fits-all approach can be applied, that we're going to have to better understand what's unique and different ultimately about each patient's tumor and then uh, cultivate uh, complementary combinational therapies uh, that are best suited for, for that individual patient. As you noted, the human immune system may be somewhat privileged in that it doesn't necessarily have the same challenges overcoming the blood-brain barrier as, for example, a drug or therapeutic might have that was either a small molecule or something similar. Can you speak more about that and what we're learning about the opportunity for the immune system to approach and then overcome any challenges with the blood-brain barrier? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, uh, glioblastoma is a remarkably infiltrative tumor. Uh, in, uh, in the brain. What we can see on the MRI scan is typically a, a, a mass that highlights with contrast uptake. Um, and that's the, what I refer to as the macroscopic portion of the tumor. But emanating outward from that microscopically, uh, typically for several centimeters, even crossing over into the contralateral hemisphere, uh, are microscopic cells, microscopic uh, tumor cells that are moving outward. And in that part of the tumor in particular, where we do not see contrast uptake, the blood-brain barrier is completely intact and um, molecules um, based on their size, their uh, chemical uh, structure and um, uh, electrical uh, charge uh, will be excluded from penetrating through the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier also includes a number of efflux proteins that are designed to uh, if, a, if a molecule can pass through based on its physical properties, these efflux proteins are designed to bind to those, some of those molecules and exclude them or uh, uh, pump them right back out again. And unfortunately, based on those mechanisms, the, most of the cancer therapies that we're currently using for other systemic cancers uh, just completely don't get through uh, where the blood-brain barrier in particular is intact. Our immune system, um, including um, the um, uh, effector arm with uh, T cells and B cells, um, can readily penetrate through uh, and, and move into the central nervous system. We know when our patients have uh, inflammatory conditions uh, or infections, the immune system readily mobilizes uh, into the brain and um, uh, uh, is quite active in those processes. So our, our, our goal with immunotherapy for brain cancer is to uh, tap into that capability and prime or optimize the response of the immune system against the targets within the tumor and begin to break down some of the 
uh, uh, evasive protective mechanisms uh, tumors like glioblastoma have put in place uh, to seal themselves off and, and uh, prevent the immune system from successfully attacking. And are you beginning to see in the clinic, even in clinical trials, evidence that therapies that can and do stimulate T cells showing promise in patients with GBM? Yes, but it's still very early. Um, the signals so far are modest at best, but um, we know, for example, that glioblastoma is a prototypic immunologically cold tumor with a very low density of immune effector cells in the microenvironment of the tumor. Those uh, effector cells, CD8 and CD4 cells that can penetrate into the tumor uh, typically are um, exhibiting either an exhausted or a dysfunctional uh, phenotype. So even if they can get in, they're um, not able to function very well. So therapies that can enhance activation of these effector cells and uh, help facilitate their movement into the tumor is a critical first step. And uh, some of the robust uh, vaccine treatments that have been evaluated um, have indeed been able to show when looking at uh, tumor samples obtained prior to vaccination and then after vaccination that there can be a significant influx of these effector cells after a proper or robust priming of the immune system against tumor targets. So I think that's a, a, a certainly a critical step. We've got to get the cells into the microenvironment in the first place if the immune system is going to have a chance. We're certainly excited by the data that we have currently, the 12-month overall survival, and we're absolutely looking forward to the 18-month overall survival later this year. We started by talking about, and you mentioned three challenges treating GBM. I'm wondering as we conclude, is there one thing that you are most excited about right now in treatment of GBM? Well, I think... Um we are still in very early stages of understanding uh, the, the mechanisms of how glioblastoma uh, protects itself and suppresses anti-tumor immune responses. And I think there's um, great effort that's being focused on this, advancing this knowledge and this understanding. Um, I think we are making progress. I think we're overcoming uh, some of the challenges or coming up with strategies that have the potential to overcome some of those strategies, uh, some of those challenges. But I think um, we still are in very early days and need to learn a lot more uh, about understanding the complexity of this tumor. Uh, glioblastoma, I think, is uh, one of the, has been one of the most, if not the most difficult cancer to treat for good reason, because it is uh, very complex. And we know from a variety of different angles, whether it be uh, DNA repair, whether it be dysregulated cell signaling, whether it be uh, angiogenesis, and now we're learning about cancer immunology, that it has multiple levels of protection, uh, multiple redundancies built in to give those tumor cells a tremendous growth advantage. And we, we are going to have to learn uh, more about um, those um, factors that glioblastoma tumors have put in place uh, and then design appropriate therapies to overcome those challenges. I think we have great um, um, excitement in the field of cancer immunology and, and immuno-oncology based on precedent and validation of immunotherapy approaches now across the spectrum of cancers including melanoma that in its day uh, before immunotherapy came along was as equally refractory uh, to, to treatment as glioblastoma uh, in terms of lack of response to chemo and radiation and, and targeted therapies, other things, that immunotherapy uh, has made a difference in other cancers. And we just have to figure out more about uh, how we can utilize the power of the immune system and overcome some of the protective mechanisms glioblastoma tumors have put in place. And I have no doubt um, that we will get to a point where immunotherapy becomes a cornerstone of glioblastoma therapy as well. And I hope our combination approaches, uh, our innovative uh, combination approach with the uh, uh, multi-antigen targeting vaccine and 
upregulation of IL-12 that the Inovio plasmid platform provides for us, coupled with PD-1 blockade, uh, could be uh, an important step forward as we move along in this um, in this overall strategy and approach. Dr. Rudin, I wanted to sincerely thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. It is, as always, a pleasure to learn from you and to speak with you. And thank you for sharing your expertise with us. It's my pleasure, and I'd like to thank um, everybody at Anovio for all of your hard work and and all of your commitment to improving outcome for um, our patients, not just glioblastoma patients, but all of the uh, cancer uh, oncology patients that you all are working for across your uh, your uh, portfolio. And um, uh, on behalf of our patients and families, thank you so much. Thank you. Please be safe. You too, Jeff. Thank you.